me? Okay. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of you know a lot more about the Channel Islands than I do. Um, and so just so I can get a little bit of an idea of who my audience is, um, I'm sure there's some, some members of the All Eight Club here. If you are, raise your hand. Well, congratulations. You have my envy. <laughs> um, and then are, are the rest of you pretty much involved with the Channel Islands in some way? Yeah? Okay. Um, are there any visitors here for the first time? All right. Well, thank you for welcoming me tonight. It doesn't seem appropriate for me to welcome you um, because you already know what's going on. Um, all right, so someone asked me just a moment ago where this is. This is actually San Clemente Island. It's a kitchen midden. You can see um, some of the artifacts here in the, in the background a little bit on the beach. So I'm going to speak tonight about the Los Angeles County Museum's Channel Islands Biological Survey. And this is a story of adventure. It's of scientific discovery, of successes and tragedies. It's not life and death tragedies, unless you count the victim that died once 13,000 years ago and then suffered a similar death about 75 years ago. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's also the story of dreams, of untold stories and of discoveries left unmade. It's a story of an expedition cut short by war. It's also the story of 33 men and women who spent a combined four and a half years on the Channel Islands. They willingly submitted themselves to backbreaking work, rough seas, seasickness, a little sexual harassment, and abandonment on one of the very islands they came to explore. This survey was actually intended to be five years long, but because of World War II, it was cut short just two and a half years into the field work. Now, to give you a perspective about the late 1930s and where science was, this was sort of the end of the golden age of exploration. The great museums of the world, the um, British Museum, the Field Museum in Chicago, the American Museum in New York, they were sending huge, extravagant trips to Mongolia and South America to the west to collect fossils and bring specimens back to their collections. Our museum, this museum, the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum, um, which was at that time the Museum of Science and Art, as well as just science, which it is now. It's now called the Natural History Museum of LA County, was only 25 years young at this time. But that didn't mean the scientists weren't just as eager as the scientists all over the world were to leave their mark on the world. So when they looked around their downtown Los Angeles offices, what did they see? They saw this hovering tantalizingly close to their western horizon. These eight channel islands, they emerge like giant granite traffic pylons that sea ships and whales have to navigate around. By the 1930s, enough was known about the channel islands that the scientists knew that they were a very special and unique place. Their geological history and isolation has given them the nickname of North America's Galapagos. Now, interestingly, the idea of the Channel Islands Biological Survey did not come organically from within the museum, but it came from this man, Don Meadows, and he is credited for being the father of the Channel Islands Biological Survey. Mr. Meadows, who was often referred to as the professor, was a high school biology teacher in Long Beach, California. He was also, and I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm sorry, but he was a lep lep lepidopterist. He was a butterfly scientist. And he had spent a number of years on Santa Catalina Island School of Biology at Avalon High School. So he knew firsthand how special these islands were. So he approached Dr. John Adams Comstock, who was at the time Director of Science um, at the Natural History Museum. And Comstock himself was also a, leopard, leopard, a butterfly scientist. <laughs> Um, Comstock was a really unique man. I mean, talk about a varied bio. He was a medical doctor. He had had a, um, an arts and crafts thriving business. He was an illustrator. He was a prolific letter writer. He was very savvy, and he'd been with the museum about 10 years when, when Meadows came to talk to him about his idea. Now, Comstock thought it was a really great idea, and um, together the two crafted... Um, the goals and sort of the outline of what the survey was to accomplish. But it was really met, um, Comstock's ability to manage the Board of Governors and the scientists really made this uh, survey a reality. And so I think that's the champion of the survey. 
Well, Comstock presented on New Year on Christmas uh, 1938. He presented the idea of the Channel Islands Bi Biological Survey to the Board of Governors. And one of the important aspects, and I'm sure it had a great deal to do for why it was approved, was that this survey, now remember it was five years of field work, was not going to cost the museum any money other than the regular staff salaries of the scientists involved. That meant the scientists had to figure out how to get over to the islands, what, what their transportation was. They had to hire their own cook. They had to buy their own food. They had to provide their own tents sleeping bags, everything. The only thing the museum really provided was some collecting supplies. So I imagine they provided some of the traps for the animals, um, some of the disposable collecting gear, plant blotters, alcohol, and things like that. But that was a really smart concept at this time to come up with. So on Christmas Eve, 1938, the Board of Governors approved the survey. The survey's goals were to investigate the biology, geology, archaeology, and paleontology of all eight channel islands, to investigate the interrelationship of one island with another, and also to see if the islands were different from the mainland. This, by the way, you might recognize as the east end of Santa Cruz. And I should say that this is um, at their camp on San Clemente. We'll see some more photos like this. Okay, so while this, oops, sorry. While this was, oh dear, okay. So this was the first expedition of this size and breadth to want to try to uh, cover all, canvas all eight of the Channel Islands. It surely was not the first. In 1918 and 1919, the California Academy of Science, which you might know is in San Francisco, launched a survey but it was primarily focused on entomology, so it's the study of insects. And it was not the last. The most recent and the last survey to include all eight Channel Islands was a partnership between the Smithsonian and the Department of Defense, which was mounted in the early 1960s. But that um, particular expedition was much broader, included the entire Pacific um, and all, a lot of the islands out to the South Pacific. And, and it was also more focused on pelagic seabirds. But again, this was the most multidisciplinary and focused survey that was ever mounted. All right, now here, um, I tried to just demonstrate sort of when the various uh, expeditions were mounted. There were 13 in all. This covered a two and a half year period. The size of the areas sort of tries to give you a visual of how long, relatively how long the um, surveys were. Most of them were from a couple of days to a week long, but you can see there was a few there that were three and four weeks. Um, in time, and all eight were touched upon. All right, so what were some of the goals, the specific goals and things that the scientists wanted to discover? Well, clearly they knew there were pygmy mammoths on the islands, and they wanted to bring back some fossils to the museum. So paleontology was a big part of the survey. Ornithology was also a very large part of the survey, and a lot of um, the Natural History Museum does have a lot of uh, bird specimens. This you might recognize to be the uh, Santa Cruz Island, Island J, which is 15% long, uh, larger than its brethren in um, the mainland. Here's an island fox. Um, mammalogy was a very important part of the survey also. And one thing I wanted to mention about um, theory of evolution, you may have heard of something called the theory of the bread box theory, which is that animals that live in isolation if they're larger than the bread box when they come to that special environment, end up shrinking in size over time. And animals that are smaller than a bread box end up growing in size. And that's because they don't have the predators. So an animal like the mammoth that swam over from the mainland was 12 feet. That shrunk down over the millennium to be, you know, six or seven feet at its shoulders. Um, similarly, a fox, which is larger here in the mainland, became little tiny creatures like this on the islands, whereas the scrub jay, grew a bit bigger. <clears throat> All right, this is Jack von Bloker. He's my favorite character. <laughs> He's sort of this darkly swarthy, handsome fellow. He was 30 years old when the um, survey started, and he was really interested primarily in bats. There's a great book um, where he is featured prominently called The Bat Bomb, and it has to do with his work with the Army in World War II 
when he tried to help save the world by building a bomb made out of bats. <laughs> and they got really far. They actually burned down a base in Utah in, in their trial runs. But he was sort of a character. He always aspired to be this great scientist. He wanted to get his PhD and be like a Grinnell from Berkeley. But he was here he is mugging in front of the camera with a little live fox. And you can see that he had collected a lot of foxes, too. Now, I don't know how familiar you all, you all are with collecting techniques. And to us today, we look at a bunch of dead foxes, and it, you know, it just sort of makes us all cringe. But back in that day, remember, science was based on collections and specimens. And so this was what, what scientists did at that time. He was also the person who spent the most time on the Channel, uh, Channel Islands. He spent 191 days um, in that two and a half year span working and camping on the island. The press had uh, quite a good time with him. They characterized him in the newspaper, and they took photos of his cute little foxes that he brought back. And he had foxes at his house. His son told me they had some foxes. He kept foxes in the museum. Um, I'm sure he, had a, he was probably quite a character. All right, anthropology was also a very, or archaeology, excuse me, was also a very important part of the survey. And one of the reasons that it was so important was because the Board of Governors felt that there was a lot of public interest, and it would garner a lot of positive press. This happens to be something that was collected shortly after, um, well, maybe even during World War II. But it's a piece of church. And the scientists at Santa Barbara, when they saw this, uh, it was collected by someone who was on the, um, the survey. They said they'd never seen anything like this before and speculated that perhaps it's um, a sea otter. The person who was uh, sort of in charge of the archaeology was Art Woodward. And Art was, um, has been credited with bringing a new kind of rigor and scientific method to the field of archaeology, especially as compared to the Victorian age. So he kept really good field notes. He laid out grids when he was surveying or when he was um, excavating trenches and middens and things like that. And he kept really good depth notes. So this was, he really um, sort of, I think, started a sea change shift in the way archaeology was performed. Now, Art Woodward had a couple of very specific goals. It, two actually were very clear in his mind. One was he wanted to find the whalebone hut of Juana Maria. Most of you here in this room probably know that Juana Maria was the, the lone woman of San Nicolas Island whose fictionalized story was told by Scott O'Dell, uh, Adele's book, Island of the Blue Dolphins. At any rate, she was, her people were taken off the island in 1935 and she was left behind. And the reason why she was left behind is not known for sure, but it's speculated that perhaps she had a child on the island or she just didn't want to go, um, you know, she didn't want to leave her home. But she was there. She lived there successfully on her own for 18 years until George Nidever, who was a sea otter and a sea, a sea otter hunter and a sea captain, decided to rescue her. So he sort of followed her footsteps on the island and figured out what she was doing and brought her back to Santa Barbara, where she died six weeks later. Um, and this right here is a plaque at the mission commemorating her life. This picture we, is attributed to being um, Juana Maria, but we're not sure if it actually is her or not. So this was one of his great goals, is to find this whalebone hut, which is depicted here, uh, on San Nicolas Island. Another goal he had was he wanted to find the legendary grave of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. Now, Cabrillo was the first white man to set foot on the islands in 1542, I think it was. Well, at least that's when he claimed the island for Spain, for his queen. Um, it is said that he had a skirmish with the islands, on, uh, or with the uh, natives on San Miguel Island and died on San Miguel and was buried there. So Woodward wanted to come back and see if he could find this grave site several hundred years later. All right, so here are our intrepid explorers. They were curious, ambitious, and ready to explore the eight channel islands. But first, they had to figure out how to get there. So Dr. Comstock started asking lots of questions the first per and contacting people. The first person he contacted was Captain Alan Hancock of um, the oil millionaire fame. And Hancock had this beautiful research vessel that he just had built with top-of-the-line 
uh, research technologies, and he donated to USC, which was right across the street from the Natural History Museum. Um, and he was conducting a lot of scientific research in uh, Mexican and, and further south in the Pacific waters. But he said, sure, I'll, I'll transport you guys free of charge as long as I'm around. The times that he wasn't around and available, the um, Comstock reached out first to the Coast Guard and asked for them to provide transportation. They said, no, we can't because it's against law to bring civilians on board. And so then he contacted the Cal California Fishing Game, who immediately put two fishing game cutters at their disposal. So this is the yellow fin and the blue, the, like the blue fin. The blue fin and the yellow tail. And this was a great relationship because these boats hauled them back and forth from Long Beach and San Pedro, took them from the islands. It, it really worked really well for them. At times, however, they were actually on the cattle boat. This is the Santa Cruz with the Valero in the background, but the Santa Cruz schooner, uh, which was privately owned, also provided transportation occasionally. So it was a mishmash and a patchwork that got them about. Okay, so now they're ready to set up camp. I love this picture because um, to me it looks a little bit like an early Cirque du Soleil tent encampment. Um, they are here on San Clemente Island uh, in near Pyramid Cove. This was their first um, island that they decided to visit. And the reason they came to San Clemente Island was because uh, they were concerned. The Navy had just bought this island a few years earlier, I think in 35. It was 39 now, someone's nodding. And they wanted to find out what the Navy, Navy was doing. Were they ruining this island? So, so the scientists actually visited this island more than any other during the whole period of time. They, they, they made five trips to this island. Um, I just want to point out these, these are actually a plant water, so they're drying plant specimens here, and they're going to bring them back with them to the um, museum. Also, I think this is very telling of the somewhat harsh environment that these folks were living in for the period of time. You know, they had to bring all their supplies, their water, their collecting supplies, their food. So even a week's expedition was quite an undertaking. Um, I think it actually was 34 that the island was fought by the Navy. All right, so this is a little bit of orientation. Um, they left out of Long Beach or San Pedro, came down here to San Clemente to the very south side. This is where Pyramid Cove is, so here's the close-up. They camped here, and this was their base camp. They called it Camp Chinny Chinich, and I'm not sure I said that right, so if somebody can pronounce it better for me, I'd appreciate you letting me know. But that was the island god, and so Art Woodward named the camp after the island god. Um, the Marines were stationed over here near Horse Beach Cove. There's Horse Beach Cove, and their, their camp was a little bit over here. Uh, one story I read talked about how they were bringing all their dunnage off the tuna and the yellowfin, and at the very end, the last load spilled into the ocean and had their sugar. So the Marines came to the rescue and gave them sugar and then helped them haul their gear up the beach. They were quite helpful. Of course, they probably didn't have much else to do. Uh, this is George Kanikoff, who actually spent quite a bit of time on the islands, too. He was a museum staffer. Um, he studied uh, invertebrates. And you, this is at Horse Beach Cove. You can just see how eroded it all is. And here's Von Bloker doing what he did. He collected foxes. He also did a lot with uh, cat eradication. So he took a lot of cats off the island. Now, you might recall that I told you that Von Bloker's real love was bats. So one day when the Marines came by offering the scientists a ride to Horse Beach Cove, Horse Beach Cove which was about two miles away, um, and they were going to give everybody transportation, Von Bloker and Meadows and another scientist jumped in the car. And I'm sure during that whole trip over, all he did was ask the Marines where some caves were. Well, they told him about this cave. This cave was about a quarter mile from the Marine camp, and it stands about... Uh, 30 feet above the water line, it's, it's uh, 20 feet high, 80 feet long, and it goes 100 feet back into the, into the island. Van Bloker must have thought that he'd landed in cat, you know, bat heaven. This thing had to be full of bat guano and bats hanging up and down. But when he entered the cave, he didn't find that. What he found was a very dry, pristine environment with some bits of brass rope, a little bit of trash, and other debris that let the scientists know that this, know that this had been ha inhabited by um, Native Americans. So the Marines started helping them excavate in this cave right away. And um, while they were doing this, 
uh, Don Meadows went back to camp to let Woodward know what was going on. And while he was gone having lunch, the uh, Marines started really helping in earnest. And the first thing they found, the first major thing they found, was a large dog skeleton buried with otter fur around it. So it was a ceremonial burial. And Woodward ended up uh, naming this cave and this site in honor of this canine, Big Dog Cave. You all probably are familiar with this boat. This is right there in the harbor. <laughs> I thought that was pretty fun. So they continued digging that day. And they actually, that first day, they found a human skeleton. Um, and so you can imagine how excited the scientists must have been. They been. It was their first major ex, uh, expedition. It was expedition number two. It was a week long. This was day four. And here they were finding some really important remains. And what to me was so, is so significant is it had to have been really a turning point for them, them realizing that, yes, they were right. This was a really important thing to do, and there was a lot to be found out here. They continued to excavate this for the rest of the trip, and um, they ended up finding three human burials. Um, one of them had 11 feet of a, a labella shell necklaces around her, her or his neck. They found two burials of chickens, both ceremonially wrapped, uh, buried, one in blue and gray cloth and the other in otter fur. And they found more mission uh, woven cloth. These items allowed Woodward to date the cave, or at least the items within the cave, to the late 18th century or the early 19th century. Oops, let's see. So here they are leaving. <laughs> I think this gives you a good idea of how much stuff they had. Um, when they left, after just one week, they canvassed only 10% of the island, but they brought back 7,000 specimens, including crustaceans, spiders, insects, reptiles, including 60 live reptiles, probably lizards, um, 59 mammals, a lot of plants, 500 archaeological specimens, and of course they found also 30 Indian um, sites in, in addition to Big Dog Cave. So it was a pretty successful trip. All right, we're going to jump forward to Expedition 4. I should probably speed this up a little bit. Um, but Expedition number 4 was the most uh, rigorous for the time. It was going to be a month long, and they were going to visit four islands. This is Santa Cruz Island, Prisoner's Harbor. Many of you are probably familiar with this island. It's the largest of the Channel Islands. Here they are at Santa Rosa Island Base Camp, I think. Many of the owners of the island lent the scientists little buildings that they had, buildings or ranch houses that they could use for a kitchen or um, you know, collect a lab or something like that. Here they are at San Miguel. Now, San Miguel Island, as you, um, OK, sorry. Here they are at San Miguel. And uh, this is base camp at San Nicolas. Now, remember, San Nicolas is where uh, Woodward wanted to find Juana Maria's whalebone hut. So he quickly made friends with this fellow. This is uh, Reggie Lambert and Reggie's two children. But it, and this is actually um, Jack Loper doing what Loper does. He had a couple little foxes with him. Um, <laughs> and this photo I wanted to show you quickly is this woman is Ona Van Bloker. So she's Jack's wife. And she started coming in uh, the late 1930s. This is actually a photo taken in 1940, but I, I just love this picture. Um, they're actually having a clam bake on the beach here. Um, OK, but what did they do? What did Woodward do to find the whalebone hut? Well, first, Don Meadows brought with him George Nidever's account of finding Juana Maria. They read it, and they studied it. They found the topographical landmarks that were mentioned in it, and they sort of familiarized themselves with it. And then they set off to find it. About 35 or 40 years later, in the late 1970s, Woodward was um, interviewed by a gentleman named Ron Morgan, who published the transcript of his interview in um, a scientific journal. And I'm going to read you a little bit of, from that journal so you can get a flavor of what happened. But he says, and this is a Reggie Lambert, uh, actually uh, a spring. This is a freshwater spring on San Nicolas Island. He says, on July 25, 1939, in the company of Reggie Lambert, I set out on horseback to ride to the west end of San Nicolas. We covered practically the same route as Night Ever and his companions 86 years earlier. Here is, we ate lunch at the Old Garden Spring, which is this area, 
where the spring issues forth from a shelving rock just at the edge of the tide line. This is Honeymoon Beach. Abalone by the thousand cluster on the rocky reefs along this section of shoreline. The sand dunes covered with middens are acres in extent. No wonder this well-watered island was a favorite haunt in spite of the drawbacks of fog and wind. Uh, Juan, uh, uh, Juan Maria actually kept her first catches of food in this area here. Here's another shot. She dried her, food, her meat and would stuff it into little rock crevices, and she would stake out meat on um, driftwood here in this area so that she'd have something to eat. He goes on. Riding out on the west end, we saw the remnants of a whalebone hut, ribs on the ground. As we rode up the hill, I remarked to Lambeth, if night ever was right, then we should find the rem remains of Juana Maria's house on that high point. Continuing, we came to a higher point from which the visibility is good. On the apex of the hill were the many ribs, scapula, etc. of a whale, definitely a hut site. This site tallies perfectly with night ever's account. This was the wreckage of the whale bone and brush shelter once occupied by the lost woman of San Nicolas. So Woodward here has another great success. I think this is just a beautiful picture with the horses. Um, now, in case you've forgotten who the esteemed scientist Art Woodward is and what he looks like, he is the gentleman on the right here. <laughs> there were some fun pictures that I found in the archives. They're not something I can publish, though. All right, so next was San Miguel Island. Uh, this is Prince Island in the background. Uh, I believe it's called Cooler's Harbor. Is that the right way? Kyler's Harbor. Okay, thank you. Um, and here is the famous sled that Herb Lester made up so that he could transport things on the beaches. Um, I imagine most of you know the story of the Lester family. They, uh, Herb Lester was a shell-shocked World War I veteran, and he came, uh, asked his friend Robert Brooks, who was leasing the island from the Navy um, as a sheep ranch, if he could come and take care of the island, and Brooks said yes. So he came out, brought his sort of uh, old maid debutante bride from New York with him, and they raised a family on the island here. And I had so much fun reading the accounts of the Lester family. They were sort of glorified in the press of the Swiss family Lesters, and um, you know, just the ingenuity of this family daring to live such a rugged existence. And, and here's Rancho Rambouillet. Um, you can see Herb Lester is this fellow with his uh, shirt with the, the ambulance on it. Um, and I, I just love reading his handwritten notes to the museum staff saying, you know, welcoming the museum, letting them know that he would do anything he could for them. And in fact, um, and his, the letterhead said he was the sheriff of San Miguel Island. That was his letterhead that was in the museum staff. But anyway, the first night, uh, Herb invited the scientists, the first night they spent on the um, island, he invited the scientists to dinner. I'm sure they had mutton that night. Um, the scientists actually did sign the family's guest book, and their names are found in the guest book, which Betsy Lester, his daughter, has in Santa Monica, California. And I can just imagine them standing around this bar, peppering Herb with all sorts of great questions about what's this and what's that. He was actually a very accomplished uh, naturalist as well. Don Meadows wrote in the progress report, one of the most pleasant experiences on San Miguel Island was a dinner given to the members of the survey <clears throat> by Mr. Lester at Rancho Rambouillet. Throughout the week, his friendship and enthusiastic cooperation was greatly enjoyed by the ex expedition members. Here he is uh, speaking with Meadows. Meadows has got the pith helmet on, and there's his dog, I forgot, Pongo or something like that, um, and he's giving them directions. I'm sure that... Uh, that Woodward also asked him for help for finding Cabrillo's gravesite, but unfortunately that was one success that Woodward did not have. And today still we don't know if he was buried here and we've never found the grave. So at the, the culmination of this uh, trip, they had collected 40,000 specimens. Um, this was the only trip they took to San Miguel Island. And sort of as a sad end note, I'm, you may know that um, a few years after this, in 1942, Herb Lester hurt himself and was given some medications um, to help the, the cut that he had sustained. But now we know that that medication causes depression and he ended up committing, murder, uh, committing suicide on the island. But he didn't do that until he knew there was a boat in harbor for his family. So it was really sad to see that and read those accounts. Here they are waiting to get off. All right. 
Uh, so all this was happening in the late 30s. You know, war was brewing throughout the war world. And what this meant for the expedition was that more and more of the scientists and more and more capable people were being siphoned off. And there just weren't as many people around to carry out the expeditions. So there was about a nine-month lull in 1941 when there were no expeditions at all until finally uh, the Board of Governors said, let's get on with it. And they launched expedition number 13, which was to Santa Rosa Island. Now, this was a very different kind of an expedition. It was highly orchestrated. They had a couple of really focused roles. The director, Comstock, was very worried that he still wanted to present a face to the scientific world, that they were mounting a full-fledged expedition, not one that was limited. But, the, but even so, the two main things that they wanted to do during this time was, one, go out to Skunk Point and find more um, middens and more archaeological evidences. And two, they wanted to go out to... Um, to Kaloti Canyon on the far, on the west end, um, or on the far end, and bring back some dwarf Pliocene, Pliocene mammoth skeletons that they had found in expedition number 12. So in, I just want to share this with you. This is a picture again of the Valero 3. And in the archives, I found an undated, unsigned, typewritten note, and it read, the outgoing trip of the Valero 3 will long be remembered. It was probably the last voyage which the celebrated laboratory schooner will make in the interest of science, as it was taken over by the Navy the following day as part of the preparedness program. So there was obviously a lot of tension, and these guys were out here on this island, but still this whole concept of what was going on was very much with them. So the first part of the trip was spent scouting out Skunk Point in preparation for Woodward's arrival. The, the scientists kind of came in little clumps, and that was what the plan was. They were spending over like six weeks from November to um, mid-December mid -December on the island. And also, John Comstock was on the island, and he was trying to figure out, how do I get my paleontologist way over to the other side? It took him a long time to work with um, the Bale and Vickers family, but finally they helped him uh, by horseback take a... Uh, the paleontologist to the far end of the island. But because of the time it took them to get there, they only had a couple days. Now what they found was they, they did refine the, the pygmy mammoth bones that they'd been looking for, which was great. But then they had to come back to leave um, because they were due back on the mainland, or this group of them was due back on the mainland. Yet they implored Comstack to please figure out how to get some more paleontologists out there because they really wanted to bring back these specimens. So again, remember this is wartime. There were not very many able people who could serve as a paleontologist to go out on an island. So Comstock used his noodle. He had one fellow who was 19 years old who was already on the island. He had been working as a student volunteer in the paleontology labs for a while. So he was there and he could help. And he thought of one other fellow. But this was a little bit harder because he had to convince this young man's mother to sign a release so that her 16-year-old son could miss two years of high school. So he did convince her to let her son, this is Jack Kofer, about 64 years older, go on this trip. He was 16 and was the youngest member of the biological survey. This is a photo of Jack in the, Mara, uh, the Maasai Mara at his 80th birthday. He's camping. He became a photographer, um, a, a filmmaker for Disney, and he, he lived in Kenya for a long time. Um, and I was very privileged to have gotten to meet him a few times. So um, here they are traveling over. When Jack came, Jack Cooper came over, they traveled over by horseback to the far side of the island. Jack recalls that it was really lush. It had been raining a lot. The island was just green. There were snow geese just covering the hills. Um, the snow geese, by the way, don't migrate this way anymore. They take an inland route. But at that time, the hills would look like snow was on top of them. It had been raining a lot. So they ended up spending a lot of time in their tents. So here's a picture of their tent. They camped in a, um, a corral so they could keep the horses in the corral and be safe. Um, but as I said, it was raining quite a bit. And this is what they found being washed out of the hillsides. They found a lot of human remains. Uh, Jack said that the skulls were literally rolling out onto the beach. Now, here's a photo um, of, of, Harry, of, of uh, Fletcher. And 
Jack asked me to make sure to tell you that he was not a pot hunter, but they wanted to document the wealth of material, the human remains they were finding. You can see that uh, Fletcher's holding a bunch of femurs in his hand, and they have a whole pile of skulls down here. He says they also tried to rebury these remains as best they could. But for those of you who um, are familiar with the area, I, I have not been out there, but um, Jack Johnson of the Santa Barbara Museum tells me that right around this corner is Arlington State Museum. So guess what? Jack thought for most of his adult life that he had found the Arlington Springs site. But in fact, Jack Johnson says that no, this was a little bit different site. This was not exactly the same site as the Arlington Springs Canyon. But they were pretty close. <laughs> now across, uh, across the world here, we uh, had Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7, 1941. And of course, the scientists on the island had no way of knowing this. But besides being Pearl Harbor Day, December 7, 1941 was also Jack Kofer's 17th birthday. So he remembers waking up that day to a beautiful sunny day, and they were going to excavate this hillside because they had found um, beautiful jawbones of a, of a mammoth. And they wanted to cast these jawbones and bring them back to the Natural History Museum. But all of a sudden, the cowboys were, came up to them and said, Pack up your stuff. You gotta go. You, Pearl Harbor's been bombed. You gotta get back to the other side of the island. We don't know how you're gonna get back to the mainland because the uh, ports had been shut down. There was a blackout on the islands, but they said you gotta go. So Jack and Harry didn't have time to take their beautiful jawbones out of the hillside. But what they did was pretty smart. They put a cast around it right there in place on the hillside, and they left it there fully believing that one day they or somebody else would come back and get these beautiful specimens. Which brings us to the final tragedy. First, this was such, I see this as such a missed opportunity for the LA County Museum. Had the war not break, broken out right when it did, who knows if the Arlington Springs woman might not have been discovered during one of these expeditions. She, she was discovered in 1952, I think it was, by Phil Orr, but this was more than a decade before that. And secondly, it, the second tragedy in my mind has to do with this specimen. Um, Jack, uh, there is no record of this specimen ever having been brought back to the Natural History Museum. The Santa Barbara Museum doesn't have any record of it. And the National Park Service has never seen it either. So do you think it's time for expedition number 14? That's all I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, are there um, records, uh, published reports of, of these expeditions? <clears throat> no. Um, that that was one of the original objectives was to conduct five years of field work, followed by intensive laboratory um, examination, and then they would publish. So, some of the scientists did publish sporadically on some of their specimens, but there was never an overarching publication. Um, I went to the Natural History Museum of LA County, the Santa Barbara Museum, um, UCI, Woodward, um, Woodward Donahue, things to use. No, Woodward was in uh, Tucson, Arizona Historical Society. Don Meadows' work was in uh, UCI. So they're sort of all over the place. Two questions. First, how did you get involved with this whole study and idea, which is wonderful? And are you planning on combining and putting together uh, something that will be a available for other people to uh, read? And, uh, oh, thank you. I hope to. <laughs> In my spare time, I'm working on that. Yeah. Um, and I got involved because I had ties to the Natural History Museum, and I went to them with a different story, a different idea, and they said, oh, no, you should do this. It's much more important. So I did, and it was really good fun. The uh, fish and game boats, the uh, bluefin and the yellowtail, yellow uh, when did they get updated? Do you know that? Updated? Oh, they're gone. They're not in 
I don't think they're in uh, commission anymore. Well, we still have a, don't we still have a blue fin and a yellow tail? They might be renditions. I know, I think the blue fin had quite, I might have some, somewhere I have records on that, but it sunk a number of times and it was raised. <laughs> but it finally sunk, I think, in Mexico somewhere. They, maybe they have commissioned, you know, the blue fin one or two or three, but like the Valero three was the third, but I'm pretty sure that they, you know, they went the way of many good boats. <laughs> So you mentioned Grinnell, and he's famous for having done surveys on transects across um, parts of California. And right now there's an effort to revisit some of those sites and, and replicate the surveys. And I'm wondering if any of the work that was done by uh, this group, if, if the site locations are documented well enough that a revisit could be done to, um, like, on the biological side, particularly to to look and see what kind of changes might have occurred? I don't think I'm in a very good position to answer that question because I'm not a scientist and I don't know what it would take. I mean, to a certain extent, I think they do have pretty good records. Uh, and I'm hoping to work with the Natural History Museum so that we can publish something that's useful to other scientists. So if that's there, then I would want to have that published. But I just. So how complete are the archives in the Natural History Museum in terms of the records that are still available for researchers or for you to complete a article on, on this and get it published? Well, um, Don Meadows kept, uh, he, he wrote what was called progress reports over the first about, uh, I'd say, four surveys that he participated on. So there's some like nice, nicely laid out you know, business reports about that. Uh, but after that, it got really spotty. Don Menos didn't participate after, I think, I think the last um, uh, survey he was on was the sixth one. And after that, I, I had to look in the Southern California uh, Academy bulletins, and I had to look in other archives to try to piece together what was happening. I looked at a lot of letters, personal letters that were written by the scientists either to um, you know, different officials or back home to their families to try to put together what was happening. So it's very spotty. One more question. The chert piece from San Miguel Island, mm -hmm. uh, where is that now? And, um, or is John Johnson? No, it's, have... it's in a private collection. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Although I'm sure Jack would, or John, Jack, John, yeah. John Johnson would really like it. <laughs> he was very interested in it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the uh, snow geese, and it looked like there was plenty of uh, island fox in. Scrub jays, and was there any other uh, mention of the other you know, fauna and flora that uh, they collected a lot of mice, a lot of different oh. species of mice. It's, there are not a lot of mammals on the Channel Islands. I know there's the fox, the spotted skunk. They collected a, a pretty good college collection of spotted skunk, um, several different species of mice, and then uh, the cats, which. You know, one, one funny story was one night uh, Von Bloker was sleeping and some cat came into his tent and was sitting at the bottom of his, his, um, his sleeping bag. And I kept thinking, man, that cat didn't know how close it was to getting a collection bag, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he brought back cats from that trip, but I don't know if that particular cat made it home on a, on a, <laughs> in a bag or not. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>